it's a great pleasure to um, well, kick off uh, 2022 with uh, the first LCN lunchtime seminar uh, given by Dr. Um, Theoni Georgiou, um, an excellent, excellent colleague and friend in the Department of Materials um, at Imperial College London. So uh, Theoni is currently a reader um, in the Department of Materials. She studied um, for her undergrad and PhD at the University of Cyprus and then moved over um, to the US to do a postdoc at Rice University. Um, she came to the UK in 2007 uh, with an RC UK academic fellowship um, and went first to Hull and then came to Imperial College in 2014 uh, to the Department of Materials. Um, she was awarded um, the 2016 Macro Group UK Young Researchers Medal for Contributions to Polymer Science, which show outstanding promise for the future. And now she is uh, the chair of um, the Macro Group um, UK, UK Committee, uh, which is quite a, quite a, quite a big deal. So um, congrats um, for that. So um, we're very pleased to, um, to have you here today, Theoni, and look forward to your talk on uh, tailoring polymer therapeutics. Thank you so much. Thank you, Theoni. Thank you, Sandrine. Thank you very much for the invitation to present my work. Um, so, as Sandrine said, I'm a, I'm a polymer chemist um, and what I like to do is systematically vary uh, the structure and the composition of polymers and see how that uh, will affect uh, their properties. So, in my group, we use a polymerization method that um, admittedly not many people in the world use, so I'm the one, one of the few experts, I'm the only expert in the UK that actively uses this method that is also used uh, quite a lot commercially. Uh, it was developed by DuPont. Uh, so we can very easily systematically vary a lot of different parameters. So you can see here we can vary the, the overall length or so the molar mass of the polymer, the composition in the case where we have a copolymer. So uh, the ratio essentially the mole, the mole fraction of the two monomers. Uh, we can also vary the architecture, so where the monomers will be within the polymer structure. So this is the case for ABC tri blocks where you can buy the position of the blocks so you can have the random uh, copolymer. And then you can vary the topology. So the 3D architectures, you can have linear star or branch polymers. And if you cross them even further, you can have cross-link gels. For all of these, what we do, uh, when we do vary, uh, we want to establish important uh, structure activity relationships. Uh, activity relationships, so how by varying this we vary the properties and how then those will affect uh, our application. Um, so my group works in many different areas. Uh, they all come from the idea that we will use uh, polymers of, of different uh, structures and compositions and architectures and see how that systematically by um, the properties for that specific application normally. Uh, but we do particles, um, make polymers to stabilize particles and to form particles um, that then they can be uh, self-assembled to form structures like this that they're called uh, polymer vesicles or polymersomes for drug delivery. Uh, we also do polymers specifically for uh, siRNA delivery, that, uh, that was actually a topic that I first started as a PhD student for DNA delivery, not the siRNA that we're doing at the moment. Uh, we also do um, uh, a lot of work on gels and um, as well as uh, making polymers to stabilize different formulations like emulsions and scaffolds for tissue engineering. Today I'm going to focus on, uh, on physical uh, hydrogels and especially on thermogels. Um, so if we do uh, look at the phase diagram of a thermoresponsive polymer, so you can have thermoresponsive polymers that present an LCST, that is a lower critical solution temperature, or an upper critical solution temperature. In the case where you have a lower critical solution temperature behavior, you go from uh, one clear homogeneous phase and then the polymer precipitates when you go above the cloud point. So each point on this curve is a cloud point and the minimum correspond to the lower critical solution temperature. The upper critical solution temperature will be exactly the a mirror image of, of this um, graph. So uh, in this case, then normally you present, uh, you have the graph on the left for homopolymers that they have thermoresponsive properties. In uh, 
in some cases, um, you may still have uh, the formation of a third phase, that is the formation of a gel. Normally, it involves uh, copolymerizing that uh, thermoresponsive group with another uh, a monomer. Uh, so normally, we, we observe this in copolymers. Uh, and then you will have one homogeneous solution at uh, low temperatures. And then uh, as you increase the temperature and the concentration, you have the formation of a gel. And if you go even higher, uh, you have the, the gel destabilizing. So normally you will either have polymer precipitation or you may see visually uh, formation of two phases. One can be a gel and then liquid uh, as well. So that's called uh, synergies. So this is the area we are interested. These are physical gels and they are thermal response um, reversible. So that means if you do lower the temperature, normally you get, go back to the one phase uh, solution for most of these polymers. Um, these polymers have many uses. Uh, so one, one, one of them is, for example, for gels for teach engineering. So the idea is quite simple. So you can uh, uh, mix these polymers with cells. Uh, this solution at room temperature will be, uh, this mixture will be a solution. So you can easily inject it into the body. Uh, when you inject it to the body though, uh, it will form then a hydrogel uh, because of the difference in temperature. And, uh, within that hydrogel, the cells will be encapsulated and start growing and you have tissue regeneration. So one application of thermogels is for tissue engineering. Um, and besides tissue engineering, um, they can also be used for uh, drug delivery at the same time. So you could combine the two. Um, and the reason for this is the fact that uh, the structure of a hydrogel mimics that of the extracellular uh, matrix. Of course, um, how fast the drugs can diffuse or proteins can diffuse within the gel structure, it depends on the overall um, start pore size or the mesh size. Uh, they can also have applications in uh, 3D printing. Um, so this one, they actually printed a, a complicated com construct of, uh, of many different things. So they have, you can see different colors for different solutions that they were printing. Now, uh, it's not very clear where is the thermoresponsive polymer. So you have PCL, but PCL is not uh, thermoresponsive. Uh, so it will melt, uh, but it, it's not the thermoresponsive polymer in solution. So actually the, the polymer here that they use that is a thermogel was uh, pleuronic F127. That is uh, where they say that we have the sacrificial material. So essentially they use the pleuronic thermogel, they stabilize their system within that gel. Uh, they printed it uh, at elevated temperature and then they let the, the material to uh, cool down and then the pleuronic then became back a liquid and then it kind of left the scaffold. Uh, and what they wanted was not for the polymer to be incorporated within the, the scaffold. So in this case then, um, the polymer is the, the thermoresponsive polymer or the th sacrificial material in the sense that it was sacrificed and it was removed at the end. Uh, you can have cases where you want to do 3D printing and you don't necessarily uh, re uh, remove the polymer, you actually want it there. So in this case is uh, bioprinting. So you print the polymer solution with cells and the necessary growth factors to the cells to grow. Um, and uh, you will uh, want to have a construct where the polymer then is there to support the cell growth. Now for all of these applications to be utilized, uh, what is important is that uh, uh, gel point, so the temperature where we have the formation of the gel. Uh, rheologically is of course uh, where the viscosity will increase and where you will have the elastic modules over exceeding the complex, uh, the viscous modules. So at this point here, for example, we have the formation of the gel and you can visually observe it by by a very simple test, so you just invert the tube. So if this doesn't flow, we consider it a gel. And normally the rheological curves and the rheological gel point does match what we see visually for, uh, you know, within a couple of degrees. Um, so tuning this gelation point is crucial because it's, uh, it's important to know where we're going to get the gel. And of course the temperature, depending on the application, is important. And so I have been working on this topic for more than a decade now. 
Uh, it was essentially the first topic that I started working as an independent academic. Um, so the first uh, monomers we used for this was uh, these three. So I have with red the hydrophobic butyl methacrylate with green a uh, PEG based methacrylate. So here in the parentheses you see uh, we have the PEG sequence. So PEG is a polymer that is uh, very much many FTA approved products. So it's even in the Moderna vaccine that I had. Um, so the first compound that I saw when they showed me the list of ingredients was uh, uh, polyethylene glycol. So we use PEG to uh, as the hydrophilic uh, component. So PEG methacrylates can be thermoresponsive, uh, as we will see later on. But this one that we use we was at much higher temperatures. Um, so we use dimethylaminoethyl methacrylate as our thermoresponsive component. And we've made um, polymers that they were ABC tri-blocks, so they had three different blocks. So with B, uh, we have the hydrophobic component with A, the PEG-based monomer, and with blue, the thermoresponsive one. And then we vary the length and the overall uh, molecular weight. So, sorry, we vary the length, there's the overall molecular weight, as well as the length of each uh, block while keeping the overall molecular uh, mass the same. Uh, so that means we vary the composition. And we also vary the architecture, so where the blocks are within the structure. Uh, and then we also compare them with the random tail polymer. Now we have also done studies where we vary the sides, uh, the length of the side group. All this was done with uh, group transfer polymerization, the polymerization method that allows us to synthesize methacrylates um, at very uh, high um, so it's very easy to scale it up and it's also uh, quite a fast polymerization method. So each step is about 15 minutes. So you have your um, the solvent, the catalyst and the initiator, and then you add the first monomer to produce the first home polymer. Um, now it's a living polymerization technique. That means this active group will still remain uh, living, uh, alive if you wish. Uh, so it will still stay active. So all the monomer has uh, reacted to produce a homopolymer and the polymer chains are still active. So you can just add your uh, the next monomer without doing any extra purification steps. So after 50 minutes, you add the second monomer, you have the formation of the dye block. All of the monomer has reacted for the formation of the dye block. And then you can add, just add the second, uh, third monomer to produce the dye block. And this we confirmed with um, the gel permeation chromatography and you can see that the molecular mass increases uh, for every step and that we don't have any extra peaks. That means the polymerization was successful. So um, for every type of polymer it's about um, 45 minutes and normally we do the whole series of polymers on the same day. Um, now in this case we have uh, two graphs where we investigate the cloud point, so the temperature where the solution now becomes uh, cloudy because we have the polymer being more hydrophobic and precipitating out. So the cloud point versus the content of the hydrophobic monomer and the cloud point versus um, the different architectures. So in this case, we have done also different molar masses. So as you increase the hydrophobic component, I uh, fill it for one curve, the uh, the cloud point decreases, and this has been observed before in some studies, but uh, because you make the overall polymer more hydrophobic, then it will have a lower cloud point. In terms of the molar mass, uh, in, for this system, we found that as you increase the molar mass, the cloud point also decreases. In terms of how the architecture affects um, the cloud point, uh, it doesn't affect unless uh, we don't have a block structure. So in all the cases where we have block of polymers, uh, so in these three, uh, so in each simple is a different chemistry of the hydrophobic group. So we're going from ethyl to butyl to hexamethacrylate. Um, but if you look at the same simples, uh, the cloud points for that, for the block based structures, they are the same. Uh, while the only one that is different is one for the statistical, the random uh, copolymers. So the random copolymers cannot self-assemble to make mysores, um, like the block copolymers, uh, so they're not as stable, so they have a lower cloud point. And that micelle structure is also important for the thermal responsiveness uh, in terms of if they're going to make a gel or not. 
So we were the first group to investigate how that architecture for triblocker polymers, uh, for ABC triblocker polymers, how would that affect the um, the thermogelation. So we know that they're going to make micelles and we know that the micelle of, of this one will be smaller size and that's confirmed experimentally because the hydrophobic block is in the middle um, then essentially if the thermal responsive is longer like it is here for the with blue we know that that will be the the length of the corona. Um, well, in this case, both hydrophilic, uh, hydrophilic chains are in the corona of the mice, and these two mice are actually of higher uh, size um, than this one. So the uh, question was, will they all form thermogels or not? Uh, and they do, but they're not all as, uh, forming a stable uh, thermogels, and they all don't all have the sole th gel transition that we want. So we want a very clear solution um, gel transition, so sole gel transition, and we build uh, like this one. So in some cases we have destabilization of the gel at higher temperatures, or in some cases we have gel at all uh, at all uh, temperatures that this is not what we want. So in this case we write from left to right the uh, alkyl side group from ethyl to butyl to hexyl. And each line is a different architecture. So ABC is where we have the hydrophobic component in the middle, uh, where for uh, these two structures, the hydrophobic component is at an end block. And the last one is the random core polymer. And we observe that um, the best architecture is the one that gives us the desirable salt gel transition uh, was the one um, in the middle, uh, sorry, is is the where the, in the middle we had the hydrophobic component, so the ABC architecture. And uh, if you increase the length uh, side alkyl group, uh, it lowers the gelation point, but um, also decreases the gel stability. Now, uh, if we compare when what happens when you we have the effect of the molar mass and the composition, uh, so from left to right, we're increasing the hydrophobic component from um, uh, um, from top to bottom, we're increasing the molar mass. So we see two clear trends. So as we increase both, we have the formation of gels more easily, but the, we have the undesirable effect of having gels at all temperatures. What we want is to have a solution at room temperature. So what we want is something in the middle. So essentially, we want intermediate uh, hydrophobic component and intermediate uh, molar mass for the ones who have tested in order to have the desirable uh, sol gel transition. So uh, we actually started doing the phase diagrams that requires, as you can imagine, a significant amount of work for each of the polymers. And what we're interested in is the area within the dotted line. So what, this is the gelation area. This is where we get the gel. And in this case, we decrease the hydrophobic component, and you can see that here we don't get the gel, we just get precipitation. Here we get gel at uh, much higher concentrations and temperatures, and here we have a good gelation region for this polymer. Um, so, um, and also very close to what we were aiming at 37, but ideally, if you do want a gel at 37, you want the gelation to happen a bit lower, so the gel at 37 is a stable gel. Um, so we still wanted to have it a bit, a bit lower. So in, in this case, we increased the length of the PEC side group, and that means we made the polymer more hydrophilic. And similarly uh, as before, then the gelation area shifts at higher concentrations and um, higher temperatures. So the more hydrophilic, um, the the higher the gelation temperature. Now in terms of uh, the architecture effect, we've said that for ABC triblocker polymers, we buy the position of the blocks and we saw that the ABC, where the B block is in the middle, was the one that uh, gave us a better soil gel transition. Uh, we tried to do more complicated architectures like the ones we see here. So we did still have the ABC structure that was uh, the, the polymer seen here. Uh, then we buy the position of the blocks, but we also do, did some random blocks so we still did die blocks um, but in some of the blocks were actually uh, the random copolymer of the two monomers so die blocks with uh, with some random copolymers for one uh, block 
but uh, as you can see, the only one that actually gave us a good relation was the, still the one with the ABC structure. So the ABC architecture uh, still uh, was proven to be the best, but it does show us that the position, there is not only the chemistry that is important in this case, the chemistry is the same, they're based on the same three polymers, but what is important is the position of, of the monomer groups uh, within the polymer structure, so the architecture of the polymer. Uh, then we also try investigate this in steel blocks, but in this case now we've moved to tetra blocks. Um, so not four different monomers, so three different monomers, but uh, four blocks because one of the uh, blocks is being repeated. Um, uh, maybe this is a bit too difficult to follow. So uh, so we have the ABC, but then we added another A at the end, and then we then started uh, uh, changing the order. In some cases, we have two C blocks and some others we have the, the two B blocks. So we did the, all the different combi possible combinations and then we repeated some of them when we saw that they were promising. Uh, so our results again were the same in the sense that the ABC architecture seemed to be the best in, the in this case. The composition was slightly different, so our ABC was this one um, where we did find again the we are quite at, uh, we are at 37 we do have a gel but as i said we wanted that to be a bit lower the two promising ones in terms of the tetra blocks were ones that um, the acbc so the b block is still within the middle of the polymer chain but not quite in the same way and again um here we still have uh, uh, one part of the b to be in the middle of the chain but the position of the blocks is obviously uh, very significant and we're the first group to systematically vary where the block will be. So the B uh, will always have to be somewhere within the middle of the polymer chain. So if we were to summarize what we had found so far, uh, we saw that the, the gel gelation point is uh, strongly affected by the molar mass and the composition. The effect is pretty much similar. So essentially, as you increase both, the, the gelation point decreases until you reach that critical point where you have polymer precipitation and you no longer have a gel because the polymer is just too hydrophobic. Um, in terms of the length of the side group, uh, it depends if that side group is hydrophobic or hydrophilic. So if it's hydrophobic, you're lowering the gelation point. If it's hydrophilic, then you're increasing it. Um, and then the architecture, that, that was something that we were very much interested to prove that the architecture will have an effect. We have always concluded that the ABC structure with the B hydrophobic component to be in the middle was the one that was making our, our, our best gels. Now, when we did try this uh, dimethylamino containing uh, polymer, so the DMAMA group they has an amino group that uh, is potentially charged. Uh, so at pH, say, pH 7, it has a similar pKa. So at physiological pH, 50% of the groups will be charged. So normally when you have cationic charges within the polymer, um, they can destabilize the cell membrane that is also, um, that all has negatively charged because of the phosphate groups. So the ratio of the charge that you have in the polymer can potentially make it uh, toxic. So even though DMA make polymers are used for drug and gene delivery because they are used in very small amounts, um, when we wanted to use it for thermogels because our concentrations are much higher, uh, they they're going to be they were too toxic. So we wanted to move away from the DMA uh, monomer and have monomers now that they don't have charges. So we tried a different PEG-based uh, monomer that has less group. So it only has two diethylene glycol groups and that makes it actually thermoresponsive in the ranges that we wanted to have. So this uh, new combination of monomers was actually uh, patented um, because nobody has ever done these polymers before and because they we have found that they form gels at much lower concentrations than any, ABC, uh, that any polymers that don't contain specific, let's say, peptide groups that we have seen so far. So just to remind how the PEC methacrylate monomers can be thermoresponsive. So depending on the R, so depending on how uh, lengthy the PEC side group is, and if the end uh, 
group is going to be a methyl or methyl group, then the thermoresponsiveness uh, change. Um, so the one that we have used, the DECMA, that is that it has only two groups of PEC, the cloud point was around 30 degrees. That, of course, goes down if you increase the molar mass. So this is the thermoresponsive group that was used in that, um, in that patent. Um, and if you also uh, make a concentrated solution of these polymers and you heat them up, then you actually observe a, a phase separation. So you can have a liquid-liquid phase separation uh, of these uh, uh, homopolymers. So it's often known that if you have two hydrophilic polymers that they're both soluble in water, they don't necessarily ho form a homogeneous solution. Observing liquid-liquid uh, phase separation of homopolymers has been uh, reported before, but this was the first time that it was reported for these polymers. And that liquid-liquid phase separation is dependent on the, on again on the side group. So coming back to um, our project, so we replaced the DEMA group with the PEC, um, with another PEC-based monomer, and uh, this actually showed us some exciting results. And and this was, uh, pardon me, sorry, I don't know. Um, so. It was a new chemistry, so we knew that we were going to work in the ABC architecture with the B uh, hydrophobic to be in the middle, uh, but we still had to vary the composition of the of the monomers to find uh, the right composition to form thermogels. So you can see some of them didn't form gels, and then uh, we started having some gels, and then one of them was very very good with forming gels even as, as low as two weight percentage. And that was one of the reasons that uh, we patented this. So the, if we compare this with the Pluronic F127, that is a polymer that I've mentioned earlier that was used for 3D printing, Pluronic F20, uh, F127 is also the only polymer that is currently a thermogel that is used for, uh, that is in clinical trials. So all the formulations that are currently in clini clinical trials, they all have this uh, known to be biocompatible uh, Pluronic F127 that is a commercially available polymer. So Pluronics, they were first patented by BASF and they are uh, commercially available, as I said, polymers. They're based on polyethylene glycol and polypropylene glycol groups. So we believe it is well established actually that the way they self assemble is they more for micelles, but then they come together to uh, this, um, uh, this structure where we have essentially a cubic uh, spherical, um, spherical micelles form this uh, cubic structure, and that's the structure you have within the thermogel. Now, if we look though at the phase diagram of the pluronic, uh, it doesn't gel in similar ways than our polymer. So, this is our polymer on the left. And the pluronic is on the right, and you can see that uh, the pluronic gels uh, is almost a gel at room temperature, and it is actually in gel at room temperature at very high concentrations. But it does require the, uh, much higher concentrations on our polymer in order to gel. And at room temperature, it is a, a gel at the concentration that is being used actually. So, in the formulations that they use in clinical trials, normally it is um, is from 50 weight percentage and above, but normally it's actually 20, unless another copolymer is present. So the overall polymer conversation would uh, will still be higher than 20. Um, so that's a disadvantage if you do want to inject the polymer, depending on how much you um, how easily you will be able to inject it. So we do uh, have we do have a project that we would like to try that involves injecting through a very very narrow uh, tubing that is as narrow as uh, my hair. Uh, in that case, the pluronic cannot be used because it blocks uh, the um, it blocks uh, the tubing. Well, our polymer can be used because at those temperatures uh, it's a solution, so it doesn't block uh, block the needle. So our gels at lower concentrations uh, in terms of toxicity, um, as expected, is not toxic. It doesn't have any charges. If you compare it to a charged polymer like polyethylenamine that we know is toxic at higher concentrations, you can see that polyethylenamine has low cell viability when you increase the concentration, 
while our polymer and the pyronic, um, they are both uh, fine. Um, and these are some images of the cells that we show that they're healthy when you have the pyronic and our polymer. Now, what we wanted to investigate though is how, why do we have this gelation and why is this gelation so good that we get it at such low concentrations? So we did uh, Newton uh, scattering experiments at uh, 25 and 37. And we can see that uh, our polymer, uh, that is the one on the left, shows a difference uh, here uh, in the scattering at uh, different temperatures. Now, the, poly the pyronic, on the other hand, is still in within spheres. So the pyronic forms spheres, as spherical mysos, and they remain as such, uh, even when they are a gel, they're just more packed when they're in the gel structure. In our case, what we have, they are almost spherical. They're actually ellipsoidal mysoles, so they're a bit of uh, one dimension is slightly uh, higher. So they're ellipsoidal mysoles at room temperature, and this structure grows and we form warm like mysoles uh, when we have the gel. And we did see this, I hope you can see it in the cryo TM. Um, so it did actually. Uh, um, uh, it wasn't easy uh, to observe this uh, at 37 as well in our uh, with the cryo TM, but uh, uh, thankfully with the help of the University of Warwick, we've managed to achieve that. So we do have some warm like max uh, structures from the room temperature, and this is still there and even more evident in the cryo TM. I hope the resolution is good enough. In terms where with SEM, uh, what you observe is obviously at much bigger scale, so you don't really see a big a big difference between the two. But for the cryo TM of the of the pluronic, you do see that the structures are much much smaller, and then in some cases here, you see the lamella arranging of the of the spheres. So I've tried to zoom in to I uh, see it a bit better here. So you have lamella is forming uh, uh, here from the spheres, well in ours you have some warm like mysos structures, but obviously they also the structure of the gel is quite dense and it's not that easy to see. Now uh, we did also again uh, investigate it with a new combination of monomers if if we change the architecture in this time, if we are going to find different results, um, if we made the, for example, tetra blocks and uh, what we have seen is that we do have a promising architecture, but it's essentially the ABC structure, just the A again repeated at the end. So it still includes the ABC structure. Uh, it is, uh, so what is interesting is that it keeps the gel stable at higher temperatures, that it may be desirable in some applications, uh, but at the temperature that you do get the gel has increased uh, uh, compared to what we had before. Uh, these are the the curves that um, that uh, the logical curves that support that, and you can see in this one that you have some initial destabilization, but then it's still uh, it's stable and forms gels uh, at all temperatures. So this destabilization we didn't observe visually; it was only logically that we observed that. But interestingly, this polymer does stay stable at higher temperatures. Now we've tried to always search for new polymers and, and monomers that we could use to make thermogels. In our latest study, we uh, have actually synthesized a novel monomer. So we, uh, in, in our attempt to try to uh, mimic pleuronics, we then synthesized a methacrylate polypropylene-based monomer, this one here, and we made then ABA polymers that are based on the methacrylate PEC at the two ends and the methacrylate polypropylene in the middle, like similarly to the pronic structure, but this is a methacrylate equivalent. If we've made polymers of different, uh, different molar masses and different compositions, and we, one of them did form uh, thermogels. Uh, of course, it will take some time in order to tune, you, to tune this in order to form gels at the concentrations and temperatures that we want. Um, so with this, I would like to summarize that there are many different parameters that affect the thermogelling, the chemistry, the molar mass, the composition, uh, as well as importantly, the monomer uh, position that we were the first group to prove that. And I would like to thank uh, my group. This was the first time we've met 
actually after COVID was our, the whole time, the first time that we've all met was for our Christmas lunch uh, in December that we've managed to have before um, it was no longer allowed. Um, so I would like to thank my group, uh, especially most of this work was done by Anna uh, and then Gianna and Joanna also contributed and, and Mark at the University of Ha. Um, so thank you and uh, for listening as well. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks very much, Theoni, for a wonderful talk and very comprehensive. Um, the, the, the floor is open for questions, so please, um, you can raise your hand, unmute your mic, um, type something in the chat. Um, OK, I, I'll get started. I, I, I was um, uh, really in, I, I was trying to picture the, the jazz and it was really nice to see the, the cryo TM and SEMs of um, of what's happening there. Is there is there an issue uh, you, you're showing the worm like structures? Is this um, would this be a problem in terms of therapeutics or maybe there could be some advantages? And do you know why they form these anisotropic structures? compared to the yeah. other one? Why is still uh, not clear? I mean, it, we have, so there are several studies that they were observed when you have a gel structure for dye block of polymers, that you have worms being present. And actually for a lot of people that believe that worms will have a better, uh, will be better in drug delivery than spherical mice or equivalent. So that's actually an advantage uh, at the moment. So we're very happy that we revealed that we had these structures. But why we're still not clear, uh, so how the packaging works that they formed this. So I'd like a, a good theoretician to help me explain that. Yeah, and and does it depend on on maybe the the, the speed of the phase transition, or can you can do, do you see any changes in the morphology? Or? Oh, we haven't investigated that. So we get a draft in a couple of minutes, but the the rate of formation we haven't actually investigated something interesting. Mm -hmm. I wonder about the thermodynamics and kinetics um, to, to do with that. OK, no, super interesting. Um, anyone else on the floor? Am I missing something? Ah, Martin, please go ahead. Sorry, just need to find the button. Hi, Fioni. Hi, Martin. Uh, thank you. I, I just had a sort of general question. How, how does the, um, and I don't know anything about it, so please excuse my ignorance, but how does the um, the presence of ions influence the gel point, or or does it influence? Yes, yeah, it will uh, depending on the system. So I forgot to mention that actually we we make the gels we started them in PBS just because we wanted to be in the same ionic strength as what you have in the body. Okay. Uh, so we know that if you have charges, that will be a diff an influence uh, for the. DMA containing one, we did see difference between the when we we had two papers on tetra blocks, and we don't observe necessarily the same results, and we do believe that are the charges. So it depends how well you screen them, because in the body obviously you have salts, then uh, they're a bit uh, screened. But uh, yeah, there will be an influence, but it's not clear yet uh, how. So if you if you have them charged too much, then you're not going to have Relation. Yeah, if you okay. Uh, so it's again a fine balance finding the right uh, amount of charges to have on the polymer. Cool. Can I ask a second question if no one else has got one? Sure. Yeah. Um, that was on, on all your nice work on the um, phase diagrams. Uh, is that uh, is that just a very how do you do that? Is that very time consuming or is there a quick <laughs> quickish way to do it? Very time well, it's it's actually visual observation observations most of the time. Uh, yeah. So we don't do the rheology for all of them because that would take forever. Yeah. We only yeah. do the rheology for normally fifteen weight percentage. It's just very simple. So we make the solutions and then we hit them up and then we keep inverting them after every how often to see at which temperature we get the gel. So we do a, we do a trial run to to get get an idea and then we do the mm -hmm. carefully at the same rate and so on. Um, okay. So it does take a long time to do right. <laughs> I bet, yeah. Nice day today. Thank you. Thank you. Let me mute up. Okay, thank you. Any any further questions? No. Um, 
Okay, on, on the eyes, sorry, uh, if it did, um, did those mice uh, get used for any other application? So, so you're, you're eventually going to load them with um, drugs and I guess organic component, is that correct? Or? So we have a couple of projects. So actually some of the polymers where we've used to print graphene, something that uh, maybe I should have also mentioned here. Uh, so we, we can just use it for 3D printing. Some of them we are currently trying to do bioprinting with a collaboration in Australia. Okay. Is and um, it, I, I think, it's, um, could you put ions in there, like magnetic ions or things like that? Uh, so we had a collaboration with Jason Hallett where we put ionic crist uh, uh, liquid crystals inside. Mm -hmm. So there, the formulation is then so complicated that it's mm -hmm. not easy to explain the result. But with the addition of those, we can then manipulate the gelation points. Okay, okay. Yeah, and then maybe the, the transition is, is, is maybe not such a big issue, but I guess in the terms of in terms of the, the micelle, they, they've also got these great properties if you can change maybe the shape and so on. Okay, great. Any further questions from the audience? No? Um, okay, well, I, I guess uh, we can always contact you. Um, we've got your address and um, and uh, thank you very much. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap up here. Thanks so much for, for your talk and, um, and for, for engaging with us. Great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.